My name is Bill Martin. I'm a grad student in the Comparative Literature Department here and an, uh, an editor-at-large at Chicago Review. Um, and I just have a few words here that I'd like to read to you by way of introduction. A few months ago, I attended a concert at the Japanese Cultural Center by experimental musicians Toshimaro Nakamura and Taku Unami, together with uh, Gene Coleman, who's a fixture on Chicago's jazz scene. The men improvised on three very different instruments. Coleman rather unconventionally played a contrabass clarinet. Taku Unami played an eccentric contraption involving a laptop, subwoofer, speaker, and marble in a glass bowl. And Nakamura performed on an equally unusual device called a no-input mixing board. This is a mixing board with the output rerouted into the input, producing a feedback loop that with a few twists of a few dials can be manipulated into sound, anything from a high-pitched squeal or crackle to an almost imperceptible deep bass. That night, Nakamura was working entirely at the low end of the range. One had to listen very closely in order to discern whether sound was being produced at all. And yet it was there, a still, shapeless, practically negative sound spread out very far below the definite fluttering reed of the clarinet and the warbling marble in its vibrating glass bowl. I had the sensation during the concert that Nakamura's mixing board was doing more than just producing sound, that it was, in a way, listening to the other instruments and to and for the audience, responding in kind to the audience's silence. It occurred to me the other day, as I was considering how to introduce Christopher Middleton um, yesterday evening, that my experience of Middleton's writing, of his poetry and his prose, as well as his translations, is similar. There is in Middleton's voice something that recognizably, actively listens to whatever he is describing and for his reader, his own listener. Possibly there is a third thing that his words, rhythms, and syntax are listening for. I do not know what it is, but it may be there. And I suspect that this quality is not merely a random or habitual effect, but is integral to Middleton's poetics across the range of his writing. I'm reminded of the final couplets in his poem, Naked Truth, which concerns a cat. So air in a painting links acrobats or bottles. So silence walks in the connected fashion of cats. There are things he knows by his silence. I would like to speak in his clothes. Like the composition of Picasso's painting Les Saltambanques, which inspired Rilke's fifth Duino elegy, listening is this silence that walks in a connected fashion, a kind of syntax or poetic approach. And thinking about it, I suspect, may be a productive way of hearing that a poetic approach itself in Middleton's work. Um, Middleton's poetry is not everyone's cup of tea. It does not always appear legibly as avant-garde, but it is profoundly experimental, meaning, in the etymological sense of that word, that it comes from trying. And if I may be permitted to make another etymologically informed or possibly misinformed leap here, it comes from an awareness of peril, of the perils of not trying and of the dangers of not listening. Perhaps for some readers his poetry is too British, for others too continental, at least is, this is what I've heard. Um, but his work, which comprises over a dozen published books, beginning with his first avowed volume, Tors III, published in 1963, to his most recent, The Anti-Basilisk, published last year, and which is ongoing and going strong, inarguably belongs to a significant canon of post-war English language verse. Fulcrum Press, the publisher of his 1969 volume, Our Flowers and Nice Bones, lists it on the dust jacket in the company of titles by a number of other poets they published who have since garnered renewed attention, not least at the University of Chicago. These poets include Basil Bunting, Ed Dorn, Robert Duncan, Lorene Neidecker, Tom Picard, and Tom Rayworth, among others. And it is largely from a sense of Middleton's significant but under-recognized position in this company of poets that Chicago Review produced its special section on him last spring. And I'd also like at this point to invite you to, if you don't already have a copy or if you'd like an extra one, to take one of these free copies up here. Um, 
There are many other areas of, of uh, Christopher Middleton's work that I could easily speak to here, and not least his important accomplishments as a translator. Um, but I'll refer you to the issue for more information on that. And now it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Christopher Middleton. Thank you very much, Bill. That was uh, very interesting to reference to the Japanese. Um, can you hear all right? Good. Um, <coughs> I, I have to ask that you um, forgive me somewhat. I have an affliction in my left eye, which means I have to keep my face pretty close to the printed page. So I won't be really able to do very much in the way of eye contact that you might expect. But bear with me, uh, and I, I just hope I won't hesitate too much. I do know a lot of these poems by heart, but I never trust my heart. <laughs> I thought I'd begin, actually, after what Bill was saying, with a poem called From the Cat, and then go on to another poem in another voice, um, From the Cat. It's really a trivial poem, but it will help to warm up. It's what the cat says. It gradually comes around to speaking English. The Niam woe is wester gone, the slavit with a shrill. Betone the ghast, obese the lid, alack the cock and till. Crumb forks to pick a winsome up. One plays the yoik, and then another dove into the first, or snubs a gentleman. You think a lucky star will strike, a wolverine will spin. Repot nest you snugly, Mr. Toff but critter risk a grin. Then if he choose to blow a skull, much bitter oft you be, since Revoluza's busted ope, wobbly the one in three. Full up your guard, swat wide away the chumps that bite behind, for on the muse left at your door, red meat you still may find. Uh, the cat is not very good at spelling, so it spells Mouse, as M-U-S-E, see <laughs> And also in the penultimate uh, quatrain, Revoluzas and Wobbly, the one in three, this refers back to political and theological motifs earlier in the collection. So I will also uh, entertain you with one of the portraits. There are 12 portraits in this collection, and one of them is of an ancient Irish emigre. It's called Ancient Emigre, and then parenthesis Irish. And I have to read it for you in an Irish voice. Once only I've heard in of all places this candy bar town where songs are composed by the dozen, composed in the beds, on the porches, a person singing at work. Ten years back, must I recall, I passed on the street in the outskirts a fellow who sang for joy while walking a popular song. Among cabbages, this 19th of November, 90, 2005, I noted, yes, among cabbages, celery, spinach, heaps of arugula, vegetables from half the world over, a young caballero singing, and it was Molly Malone. Sweeping the floor, fresh-faced he was, with a daredevil forelock, and as he sang that song of the streets, some broad, some narrow, I pictured rooftops, flat rooftops in Corsica. Women sing there soon after sunrise, answering songs sung by their neighbors at work hanging the laundry out. On broccoli, snap beans and cauliflower dwelled this morning the eyes of shoppers, all attentive to tasks having today to be done. That Molly Malone could have sunk so deep in the people who push their carts hither and thither, heaping the produce up, the shaft of her glance, startled them with obstreperous beauty, rough into the bargain, from counting the pennies, privation, abuse. Could they marvel, I ask, at nothing at all? My cart hummed with its wires, my kilo of strawberries trilled, con amore the pretis, onward wheeling the work with a song, did it? Briefly, midnight, now I inhale and smell in this paper I scribble on, Molly, her skin, her wheelbarrow is parked, my cap's fallen off as friendly-like, 
in a bombarded garden. She comes to be mine. I don't usually speak in that voice, but it, it does me a little credit, I think, that I did have an Irish ancestor. So it is alleged. Yeah. Um, keeping with this most recent collection, uh, since it is always a pleasure to read the latest works first, I'll continue with another of these portraits. It's called Orbiana. Uh, Orbiana was the wife of the Emperor Severus Alexander, and uh, it was not a great success. Severus had a, a very powerful uh, self-willed mother called Julia Mamia, um, and Mamia saw to it that after a fairly short while, uh, Orbiana was exiled to Africa. It is otherwise not known where she went but I make out that she went to Leptis Magna, which is a, then a, a city newly founded by the emperor uh, Severus, um, not this, uh, Severus Alexander, but uh, Septimius Severus, who had been one of the most important emperors in the few decades before Severus Alexander. Anyway, she's writing to someone who knows, and it's just called Orbiana. And it's about you know, Christianity, and it's also about the plight of a completely harmless, charming, difficult, and slightly waspish, waspish person. Uh, by waspish, I don't mean wasp. Uh, in, in exile. You know? uh, and she mentions, first of all, she, she's writing this letter because she's just heard that her ex-husband and ex-mother-in-law have been murdered. They were murdered near Mayence in 235 AD. I could never help uttering a, a light soupir, just one, whenever the times were hard. Today, just one more, it hardly passed my lips, but murdered they were, such news, murdered near Mayence, those two who sent me here to Leptis Magna. The emperor was never up to it, really, in peace or war. She governed, Julia Mamia, selecting me for him. So when she found, to her astonishment, that I, a tiddler, had it in me to influence Alexander, she packed me off with his consent. Nobody knew where. Nobody either now will inquire where I come from. Nobody will know which city in Africa took me in. So I have disappeared. But the shopping is quite splendid. In this great new city of arc arcades, several temples to various divinities, a triumphant arch, the amphitheater, and almost superfluous fortifications, there are nice people to listen to, and black weavers who manufacture singular objects to recline or to stand on. Yes, for the Christians, mother had a soft spot. From Syria once, she had a cavalry escort sent to save that tyke, whatever his name was. It starts like mine, with O and R. I like to beachcomb. It attracts, ha <laughs> ha, I mean the beach attracts provincials. And yet, and yet, from Rome and from Pamphylia come real artists with guitars who chant devotedly of ocean, even to the moon. I never had children. What a shame. And the years of loving, few complicated by mother, them I've forgotten now. The shopping gets, by the way, a bit monotonous. Funds I was allowed exhaust themselves somehow, even though I did, if I remember rightly, stir up a nasty fracas, insist on statutory imperial support. I feel behoved to say, don't ever quote me on this, that I am not yet negligible, negligible enough to mark the passage from finite to infinite. I was not one to wheedle, but those officiants, what rot they talk. Into the atoms they ship their designated sacrifices, not into some dock of heaven. Where bodies tasted chance, they make a waste. You should see me glimpse now and then into the shrinking bijou bag under my bed. The wind cooling profuse vegetation 
and the display of stars at nightfall are supposed to console. They don't. Disease, at least, is hereabouts minimal. What a mercy my destination was not Mauritania. That's such a long, long way west. And Mauritanians, they do say, are a scruffy lot. Please write to your little friend, Orbiana. In her coins, she is portrayed as a very delicate little head uh, with a charming, rather aquiline nose and a little coronet. Uh, evidently, she must have stood about five foot one, whereas the emperor was probably the huge, five foot six. But anyway, it was her, her mother-in-law who gave her this dreadful time for Orbiana. Right. Another of the portraits I will skip just to for variety. I'll come back to it in a moment after this. This is a sonnet which I translated uh, from Robert Desnos, the <coughs> French surrealist poet, uh, who was rescued from Auschwitz, I suppose in May 45, and died of the end effects of uh, typhus in June 1945. And this is one of the last sonnets that he wrote. He's a great surrealist poet. Uh, it, his original rhymes, this one doesn't. It's a very lovely meditation. Uh, on this brink of an abyss where you will disappear, consider still the rose. Listen to the song you sang, time was, at the door to your house. Consent to be a while again, just who you are. Then you will go forgotten, back to your ancestors. Oh, passerby, with all your seasons over, in the planet and its harvest you will be lost. Try not to hope you'll be one day reborn. A star adrift in the depth of time rejoins the many points of light, points of darkness on the river shore where you unlearn to be. Matter had come in you to think about itself. Remote, now vanish echoes of a love declared. Pure motion moves forevermore, no mind. Very strange poem. Well, there's that. An uh, elegy of the flowing touch, which comes from a series of uh, 21 poems, actually, called um, 20 Tropes for Dr. Dark. Uh, elegy of the flowing touch is based on a, a scene that uh, is probably <coughs> still available for our beholding. And in Cassis, all these poems are written in Cassis, except one that was written in Istanbul. In Cassis, um, there is a, it's a little French fishing village, now a tourist town, and there's this beautiful little harbor. And uh, from that harbor, there goes once or twice a week um, a mother boat trailing little rubber boats with children in them. They're children of the town who are learning to sail, learning about the sea. And up front, there is a wonderful dog. The dog sits in the front of the mother boat and functions as a sort of um, figurehead. Well, I know, of course, it's a daily sight there, but I saw it for the very first time, and so did an American uh, wannabe playwright who was just living downstairs, and we had a discussion about it in the street. So this is, this is where that poem began. <clears throat> Elegy of the Flowing Touch. Almost everywhere there's a poem lying around, waiting for someone to lift it up, dust it off. For instance, the argument with a neighbor about a large dog. Was it a German shepherd or a mutt? Would it jump into the sea hereabouts to save a child if a child went overboard? The argument was conducted in civilized terms, but we stood in the street. There were distractions, in spite of which we both felt for the crux. Does a dog have a will capable of the good? Insistent as I was that 
however eagerly it swam toward the child, a mutt, being untrained, might forget the good it had set out to do. I was brooding on something else, the dignity of the dog. Whatever it was, standing as we had seen it, there on the prow of a small rubber boat, the figurehead of a dog, did it know how dignified it might look to the likes of us? Who cared if it jumped into the water? Who cared if it collared a floundering child? And under the brooding lurked, not yet material, a poem scheming to coax into focus a local image. Ten dinghies fluttering tiny peppermint sails, each dinghy a nest with two children in it, strung out on a cord behind the rubber mother boat, and all the children laughing, waving, and feeling free. The bursts of song from the children's throats, and before them gold against an oceanic blue, the figurehead dog, ears pinned back by the wind, his attention to it all, and a great joy in his jowls. Even then, the scene, and the poem would pivot on breathlessness, a moment of suspense, how, it would say, as the procession of dinghies headed away from the coast and out to sea, either their voices had passed out of earshot, or else the children were learning fear. The silence now as they skim over the water, the blue of a ravening deep underneath them. And another of the Dr. Dark poems. Uh, this is the one that was largely written, anyway, finished in Istanbul. And it's based actually on a, a memoir of Gogol that I read in a book by Dmitry Merejkovsky called Gogol and the Devil, which is completely out of print. Uh, anyway, uh, Gogol was in Rome early in the 1840s. And he was invited out to a garden party. And on that figure of Gogol, plus another one from Gérard de Neval called Le Ténébre, and a figure called Dr. Noir in a prose book by the poet Alfred de Vigny, a prose book <coughs> called Stello, I based this figure of Dr. Dark, who is a sort of ghostly figure who flits in and out of these poems. But in this one, he's much more uh, foregrounded, much more vividly and physically foregrounded. Um, and this, this is based on that, that anecdote of, of Gogol. Uh, the moon from a box of locum. In a country garden outside Rome, a Dr. Dark, Madame Smianova's guest, one summer evening took a box of locum. Children all around him breathing fast, his Russian fingers taking locum out so lean, and made a moon of it, the closest to something in the sky we'd ever been. The empty box, a moon at full, we passed it from hand to hand, wondering just why the lining he had smeared with olive oil and spit shone so somberly in the dusk. And gasping, all of a sudden, not depressed, the doctor skips around with it, finds a candle stub, melts the wax, plants it on the nether rim, so now the paper lining glistens silver. We children were allowed to touch the moon and with some ceremony hang it, and hang it in a tree. We said, here's our theatre. As of now, for all our future dramas, this confection, this moon, transfiguring desire will glow. Our bodies measure heavenly perfection. The doctor struck an operatic pose and funnily twirling a finger up, beware, he boomed. Celestial equations tip the scale with zeros. Our rhymes, they tumble past us unredeemed. The only total here below is night. You see a rising moon. I see a cyclops. This garden incubates our grand collapse. Industrial wars will torch these fantastic empires. The children of your children will be cindered like that. He snapped his fingers by the cyclops, see them extinct in the bowels of the cyclops, and soot our candle wick. Oh yes, we cheered for more. But like a dancer, now the doctor turned with swift wide subrisos, bounded across the lawn, 
and disappeared indoors. Something of Edward Lear at the end of that, but I don't quite know how it stumbled into the poem. Right. Ah, and very briefly, so that you can get a breather, you need to look at the dead friends. Who can they have been in that red car, going by so fast, waving, and with a hello so loud, it still hangs in the wind. Still it softly rings the compound of my thought. And another one in a funny accent. This is um, an accent, actually, I cannot imitate. It's in this book of the mortal fire, 2003. Um, I heard this is a, a true story again. And it involves uh, a scene from the First World War where a young Italian is supposed to shoot people who are... Um, uh, it's uh, the warfare, anyway, up in the, the, the Tyrolean mountains in 1917. Uh, maybe I shouldn't sort of give you all the context, but just a sketch, anyway. Here is this old Italian telling the story of how he'd met this American medic who had an Austrian over his shoulder and was bringing him down the Italian side of the mountain in the midst of all this fighting for medical treatment. And how his orders, the soldier's orders, were to shoot. But he didn't. He didn't shoot. It's a very touching little story. Anecdote of 1917. Drop the Austrian, I say. He will not. Drop the Austrian, or I shoot. No, he will not. In Italian, I speak. Did he understand? A medic. Yes, but a big Americano. Shelling on the mountain. Smoke. Soldiers, many thousand, dead. Guess how frightened. Noises, dying. Then he stop. I take my aim. At him, not at the Austrian feet in socks across his shoulder. Orders are to shoot, puff, unless the wounded is Italian. Me with rifle, lifted, aim. Boys of twenty, both, we look. Did he understand? Next moment, both of us, we burst out laughing. Up from under, zampiante, comes the laugh, and through our bodies, so we laugh. Not long, and down, down the winter mountain goes, picking his way, Americano. I watch for him. He wish me lucky. I tell my story only once, once before, much intimate. My really not important story. Why, Hopkins' sonnet, ladies say, just like that. Ladies speak. Racing lambs have fair their fling on a pear tree yesterday. All of glass above the lambs, first bloom, now leaf, little faces brush the blue. For pity's sake, an old man from a sweeter tree, such laugh as then might never shake. Uh, there is a sonnet by Gerard Manley Hopkins, which I discovered soon after hearing that anecdote. So I spliced it into the end of the poem to uh, establish or re-establish the sense of you know, youth and coming to be is so much more necessary uh, for the joy of creation and killing people. And he, of course, included in the frame then is the notion that this Italian who is telling the story also had an experience with an English-speaking lady, probably una americana. <laughs> to whom he had confided this story only once before. So it has its sort of uh, built-in organization. Sometimes that's one way to get over the randomness of words, if you can have things sort of folded into one another without tightening the uh, fabric up too much. Uh, yeah, let me now go back to the portraits. This is Fellow de Sé, um, <coughs> which is like most of the poems in this collection, uh, supposed to 
be all on, along the line pretty close to fact. In fact, the uh, phraseology, let us say, as well as some of the actual discourse of this poem is quoted verbatim from a fellow I met uh, when I was out for a walk and he was fishing uh, on Red Bud Isle in Austin, Texas. And he's a Tex-Mex fellow. I wasn't. But I was very curious about this word fellow de se. I had thought i have heard it so often. Was it Spanish? I didn't know. I hadn't looked it up. And I asked him what did it mean. He didn't know either. But actually, it's Portuguese euphemism for suicide. Phew. Well, lucky we didn't know. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have got the poem. <clears throat> when he had pulled upright his jingle jangle cart, he said he hoped he would not be disturbing me. He unpacked his kit from the cart and lost no time, but baited his lines with worms from a box of dirt and made a long cast for the lead to plop in mid-river. When he says he is Tex-Mex but spoke as a child no Spanish, he explains that he took himself soon to school, learning the way they speak it in Spain. When he was little, his father died, says he, so he helped in the house cleaning and sweeping cooking the beans, washing dishes for mother. When he had a family of his own, two boys and a girl, he told them one by one as they grew, there'll be no lazy nobodies in my house. Told them that when it was time to grow up and that it won't be easy, but here's your support. Grow up to be somebody with an education. Now there's my boy in the Marines. This war, it makes no sense. But then his line is aviation, the mechanics. In law school, the girl, the other boy in medicine, and all three speak Spanish as well as they do English. When he's set to make a cast with his third rod, he says his father-in-law's funeral cost 10,000, but his own uncle's was cheaper for he was cremated. And then he is cast with a fourth rod far out into mid-river, and he says that he'll be tonight in Marble Falls where the catfish bite better, that because of the funeral he has a week off. But when he went to Mexico, he didn't like it. Didn't like the Mexicans, a crooked lying crowd, says he. They look down on us, call me a gringo. Me? I'm a carpenter, he says. I can build you a pretty house, restore where wood has gone to rot, repair, adapt, install any kind of cabinet. Anything to do with wood, I can do it with finish. Fishing is just a pastime when you're needing it. And it is clouded over. Now the fish like that. Yes, he says, any kind of wood, I can handle it. And we were standing under a water cypress, a very tall tree that had gone brown by March. The tangle of its roots ran in long looped cylinders out under water while he talked, wearing a cobalt gimme cap with NY in a monogram, an olive green tabard, pockets in place of emblems, drainpipe trousers and spongy soled suede boots. Yet all I had asked was if he knew perhaps the meaning of fellow de se, supposing it's Spanish. Not theft, he said. Thieving is rova, rovo. What you said, might that be in a book? <laughs> <laughs> so it's now in a book. What he said about it being in a book, anyway. So <laughs> there again is this sort of curve of the discourse back upon itself. Yes. Okay. There's a poem called Marion Bad, 1814. Uh, are you interested in Goethe at all? Anybody are interested in Goethe? After all, aren't you all literary people? <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. No, it's, it's a two and a half pages, but it's, it's Goethe's reflections. Uh, you see, from 1797 until 1827, that's 30 years, Goethe was planning a story, which he was still not quite satisfied with it when it was already in proof, even in 1827. It's called Novelle. Uh, it's a famous narrative. Um, and in 1814, he was with Mariana von Willema, uh, a, a very lovely young woman, in Marienbad. And he's drinking wine with her. Oh, I'll read it. 
it's it's okay. It goes pretty fast anyway. Uh, and he's afraid that he's never going he'll never be able to get the, get a grip on this story which is floating around in particles in his mind. What's he to do about it? So what you get in the poem is various sections of the story, little details from it, but they're still floating. And it, it's like this in, in sort of uh, Latinate uh, with uh, indented lines. So it looks all nice. Marion Bad, 1814. A lion, aha, has to have broken loose. A boy, he puffs his cheeks, his, he fingers now a flute, picks out a tune with singular glides, while at the fair lodged overnight for Sunday show an image advertising fright. A lion loose, everyone aghast, is not the same as those hussars of 186. We still pick out the marks of gum butts grooving our front door. What a porridge, speak of it to nobody. A complex gestates, makings of a star, in secret snowballing, spacious dusts. Meanwhile, Faustus, done with sundry loving metamorphoses, to Hafiz now the steeps, a distinct summit at my oriental elbow, Hammerburgstahl prompts oratio stricta. Well, so I scale it. Musi saltadesca, too, I recall, me in my dressing gown. I stage an entry, sailing down the stairs for Marshal Ney, a bed, quick sharp. Christiana marched the ho hoodlums out. How long, Lord, how long gestation takes. Latent lion, latent flute, latent uncle. Up he rides with sketches now. No, plans, that will be more likely. Plans of a fort, a fort that crowns a hill far off. And in a room which has a view, he lays them out, explains a dilettante details. First bedrock, a compounded permanence. Next vegetation, local foliage evolving, formality at last, the architecture. We are seeing tower, coin, buttress, the projects ego put where id had been. So was id the story or us? us, an infinitely polar plurality, and when the richer concord shatters single vision, what comes next? Uncle rides in company, the princess, who gazed in rapture at the plans, a gentleman for escort. Through the tiny town they ride, a poster picture jumps at them, explained by Uncle, lion loose, hundreds screaming, folks are drawn to terror, how? Hats off to Goya, he knows it is alleged, and serves undistraught the unconditional. To see the stuff behind the plans, on they trot, sort of dreamy. Uphill, the fort exists. As they approach, a puff of smoke, then a bang. The town explodes, or something in it. We smelled roof beams in our town, blankets, furniture on fire, Peacetime now should mean another smell. Smoke in the veil, a distant puff, a lion loose. But here, how else to let the animal violence in to tell of human aptitude to foil it? Now, what if art comes true? Princess has to tremble, uncle is undismayed. When this way to them very quietly comes, ah, 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 oh, the horror. This can be no picture. Here or nowhere is Africa. What will the lion be thinking? What is that gypsy doing? What is boy? It's as if he's seeing all these things like Mozart saw music. Never talk about it. So we tell ourselves, little figments, hold quite still, hold still, while into the wind you lean, it crystallizes in its time, mutable gestalt of forest paths, forked with loops, dovetailed, violence and virgin music, strife resolved in a plasticity. Can words of ours reach out and twist our story round, so to speak it? Dispense, dear God, a proper tone, so let it speak below a viewpoint. Forth strode across the turf a boy, with bloody ankle bone, folds of flesh, 
burrs matting his mane, a lion bewildered, should rush at him and bite? A flute upon his lips, the boy, his breath is entering the tube, and out rises a melody that rolls over Leo, one vast tranquility. A spell, now simple trust is acted on. Are we a magpie or a jackdaw? A sharp thing sticks in Leo's lifted paw. Would this now be the end of it? And who built Thebes? Stone coheres with stone, though lifting any was labor, terrible, day after day, snapping backs, sweat in torrents. Flute boy leads on a light string, his lion home, and others follow. Mustn't be bookish, only enough so to forestall what ifs, what, for example, if civilization has to be ripped whole out of savagery, all eyes open hard on any default, on music, on compassion. The littlest lyric might do, to end with, as if the flute's unheard tune might be syntactical, as if it coaxed into the clear a spirit. Hasn't Uncle said enough? He packs probably his sketches up. He's off. Princess, her cheeks at supper, oh, how rosy. How long to go ripen words and let <coughs> one day the leaves flip, a tale be told. Zuleika, look at me, the bottle empties. <laughs> oh, never drinking white wine. Where is Julia? I forget which kind it was. There they are. <laughs> yeah. They were drinking white wine in, in uh, my yeah. event. Okay. Now we're getting on for time. I'll read just one more, and it's uh, called In Memory of uh, W.G. Sebart. This is also from uh, his new book. And it brings together some of the motifs elsewhere in the book, but it's actually in another section. Um, just one page. Are you familiar with, probably most of you, some of you are more familiar with Sebat's work than I am. I've never read a single book of his. <laughs> But I read a very good article, <laughs> just like all of us, cheating. I thought the article was so central and so intelligent that there must be something there. <laughs> but, but it also kind of lifted out of uh, nebulousness a number of the concerns which are voiced elsewhere in this little collection. You know? And it's about the bipolarity of, of uh, not the pathological bipolarity, but how, how uh, we oscillate between devils and angels, and uh, how nowadays it's difficult uh, to think without fear, but it's also important to let fear set you free to think. That's how it ends. The memory is W.G. Sebar. A bipolarity remark native to the species. Observe ecstasy in acts of laying waste. Consider your apprehensions at the sight of a bone pulled out of an avalanche. How ecstasy and apprehension skip. Consider next the supervision of intellect. A noise not stopping, very loud, destruction. Heed the skeleton's poise as if to speak. Amnesia, aphasia, anesthesia, remark. While fleets of souls all twittering take off, a blank occupies pained heart or vandal head. One who came through clutching a god Contemplate the God who took away his speech. Thorny species, a Kalahari shrub, shrunk by heat at day's end, contrives nocturnally to unwind, seasonally to sprout, as if that sound were what a desert listens for, heed during a breath or two of cool at night, the rustle when a thorn 
a lucky leaf expands. There'll be prognoses printed out decades in advance and on a scale so vast that guesswork is eliminated. Surely with some device we'll temper any rising heat, banish the blank from this heart or that head, bury the hatchets for people of tomorrow, cultivate sensibly earth. All the nursed grudges volatilized behold, reformed into the rose we give to those whom fear set free to think. Thank you very much. The Kalahari shrub does exist. I read about it in a remarkable book called Desert and Forest by a man called Nesbitt, a Scottish engineer who traveled on foot through the Kalahari Desert, I think of the 1930s. And there's a strange shrub which is absolutely pounded down by the heat during the day, but sort of manages to ease up again and, and to uh, come to life again in the night when it's just for a moment it's, it's cool. So it's all matters of fact. <laughs> Nothing is invented. <laughs> mm. well, I expect everybody would need a break. Um, and, and, uh, punctually at two, I will um, set about uh, giving you a little talk. Yeah? <laughs> uh, how would that be? All right?